My guest on this edition of Beyond the Boundary is somebody who's been synonymous with Lancashire cricket for over 60 years. Started as a player in the 60s, went on to captain the side, play for England, then became uh, an umpire, first class umpire, coached Lancashire, coached England and became one of the 21st century's fantastic and best broadcasters. It is David Lloyd. David, it's great to see you. Where did it all begin then? Well, it, it, back in 1965, and, and it began on the ground, and it, it's, it's obvious is that, but when you played for Lancashire Boys, you played here, which is a, a great place when you've got the committee and the coaches or whoever who can see the young talent coming on. We played right at the corner, right at the end, next, next to the pavilion, the old pavilion, and I did all right. So it was North v South, did okay. And then Lancashire versus Yorkshire and Cheshire and did okay. It, it was a fair trek in then when you, oh, w- when you, when you used to <laughs> start as a, as a junior professional, felt like it was a fair trek in from Accrington in the 60s. It were three buses for a start. <laughs> you know, when, when buses, upstairs it were for smokers. Now I've never smoked in my life, I had the filthy habit. Uh, but you always wanted to go upstairs to sniff these blokes smoking <laughs> these senior service and caps them full strength. <laughs> and you put your kit bag, if you remember, when you got on the bus, oh, it was like bag. a well. So you put your kit bag in, there was no chance of anybody nicking it. It was always there when you got to Morsley Street, I got to Morsley Street, and then I think I caught the 48 bus up to close by the football ground and then had to walk. Um, but I, w- I wasn't the only one. There were lots of yeah. us uh, came in that same sort of journey. And you came into a, a Lancashire environment. Um, and I think, let's be fair, in the, in the early mid-60s, Lancashire weren't in a, a period of, of success, but they had some fantastic players. Mm. Uh, one of the finest bowlers of all time in Brian Statham, for one. Jeff Puller. Yeah. Ken Higgs. Yeah. Jack Bond was around. It, do you know, it's an absolute mystery. When you, you look at the calibre of players, you think it was so wonderful players, but you're dead right, we couldn't bat. We couldn't get runs. And Statham and Higgs got 100 wickets each, and I think we finished second bottom. And it, it was always... The, the, the laws of the game, or the, the structure of the competition, was really odd. They, they kept chopping and changing, and I, I recall that you had to come out at 65 overs, you had to come out at 100 overs and declare. Three day matches, uncovered pitches. So you're always sort of manufacturing games to fit the three days because inevitably, particularly here, we were losing so much to the weather. You, you look at Old Trafford now and the drainage, which is state of the art. Back in the 60s, it, no, it was just natural soil and if it rained, you'd deluge in puddles everywhere. You just didn't play. And so we were always constantly manufacturing games over a three-day period on uncovered pitches. Mm. What about your first impressions then of Brian Statham mm. and Je- Jeff Puller? Brian yeah. was captain yeah. in the 60s, fantastic bowler, mm. but um, uh, not perhaps the best captain. Well, we used to, Tommy Greenough and I, and sometimes we'd play together. And Tommy used to say, we'll be coming on any soon, any time now. I said, how do you know that? He says, because the, the 48 bus has just <laughs> gone past. He says, at five to one, we usually come on when that goes past. So, and it's uncanny, that's the number of times that we, you know, you get that last over before lunch, um, if the seam is a ball first up in the morning. Um, but Statham was a wonderful man. He was a fantastic man. And he just led by example, really. Jeff Puller was brilliant, absolutely magnificent. In the, He's a left-handed opening batter. Here's this kid from Accrington coming in, batting at number eight, showing a bit of promise. And he would know that he's going to elevate, this young kid's going to elevate, and eventually he'd open the batting, which is what I did. But Jeff helped me all the way. He looked after me. Was cricket your, your first love? Because no. Because you were a good footballer no. and all, <laughs> No, it? it still isn't my first love. <laughs> I like horse racing, golf, 
and football. I'm an absolute football fanatic. I, I love football, particularly lower league football. And I, I still go and watch uh, whenever I can. Um, York City, he said, I live over York Way now, so we go and watch York City. I'm a season ticket holder there. They're in National League North. And even now, I take my boots with me, thinking I might get a do, because they're not very good. Um, and, of course, Accrington Stanley is my club. It, but you were synonymous with the yeah. resurrection of Accrington yeah. Stanley, weren't you? Yeah, I was a director for a while, and then my mate bought, bought the club. And he pulled me on one side, and he said, I've got some bad news. He said, uh, you're, I know you're a director, he said, but I'm sacking all the directors. I don't want any of them. I'll, I'm running the show. I said, thank you, thank you. It's costing me a fortune, this. Because if one of the players, and this is in the bad old days, if he got subbed and wanted a shower and went and put the shower on, the floodlights went off. <laughs> so we had to have a new electric system and so on. But we've now got a cracking club. Hey, it's a bit different now. I've read in the papers brilliant. this week that there's going to be a new champagne bar. Yeah, it Not is Not something brilliant. that is synonymous with Accrington. No, I, don't, I think that'll struggle, really. Uh, we've got a, it's a conference centre, um, which is, I think it's 400 or 450. Uh, hospitality and conference centre, which, which is bang on. And now we've, got, we've never had it, tarmac. We've got tarmac <laughs> up there now, which is great when you drive your car in. But your cracking club now, Andy Holt, is the owner, the chairman, and he, he's done a brilliant job. Let's just come back to Lancashire and the late... Late 60s, there was a there was a sea change in mm. in Lancashire's performances. It was the start of a fantastic era of one day success. Mm. What triggered that? I think the, the the club had had a in the 60s there was this unrest, and then we got a great chairman. I mean, gregarious right up front, a bloke called Cedric Rhodes, and. He shook the place. He absolutely shook it up. And the, you know, a lot of things you'd say, I didn't like that about Cedric and I didn't like that about Cedric, but he was here every day, fully hands-on. And he gave the, the club a real shake. And then Jack Bond took over as captain. When they were scratching their heads, thinking, who, who should we make captain? Jack to replace, the twos. replace It'd be To replace Brian Statham. Yeah, and I think they advertised in the Telegraph for a captain that might might have been before Brian Statham, but Jack was Bondy was playing in the twos, and they give him the job, and I would think that that would be short term at the time, but it, it coincided and corresponded with a, a lot of young lads coming from club cricket, and you were playing uh, Saturday Sunday club cricket, league cricket knockout cricket. We all came together from different areas. Um, lads from down St. Helens, Ken Shuttleworth, lads from up Mosley Way, Staley Bridge, John Sullivan, Harry Pilling, lads from down Lancashire League, myself, and latterly Jack Simmons. And it clicked. And suddenly we got a one day team playing one day cricket to full houses. And they were glory days, real glory days. When you consider Sunday League, I think you started at two o'clock, you've got mm. to finish your first innings at 10 past four, be 16, 20,000 on a year. And again, it, it, when you do interviews like this, you can recall there were no advertising boards. They, they didn't have any. Mm. They weren't that sort of, it wasn't that sort of club. There'd be half a dozen people would work in the offices, that, that's it. And so, the crowd used to spill onto the pitch with a boundary rope and the crowd behind the boundary rope and you could have four or five thousand people sat on the ground. And so it, it was a great atmosphere. I mean, a fortress right on top of you, the crowd. What was Jack Bond's secret then? Because... The, Man management. The, and undoubtedly he had some good players yeah. or some good players um, who were starting to come to the mm -hmm. fore. I'm thinking of Lever and Shuttleworth yeah. and Lloyd and Wood. Yeah. And the overseas players, yeah. Clive Lloyd yeah. and Farouk Engineer. Yeah. yeah. But Bondy's big secret, man management. He got the great name, Bond. That, that was what he did. He bonded a team together. He was totally unselfish. 
And if we were in a jam, he'd go in and, and sort of stick it out, and grind it out. If we were flying, he'd drop down and send John Sullivan or anybody else to, to give it a whack, Simo and David Hughes. So he was honest, unselfish and great man management. I mean, he managed me. I could get a bit volatile and he could, he could manage me, no problem. You say you were volatile, David, yeah, and that stuck with you probably through your career and, and, and probably still a little bit in your life now. But, but you've obviously learned to temper yourself. How much did, uh, of an influence was Jack Bond on you in your future, not only as a cricketer, but as, when you became captain and then coach, then an umpire? Mm -hmm. um, how much did, did Jack Bond influence you? He was a massive influence and two others at the club were massive influences, Edward Slinger, and Bob Bennett. They were great influences and they knew how to calm me down, how to sort of shut me up a little bit, as did Jack. But Jack must have seen something to push me as captain because I got, he was going to retire and I got, he, he told me that, follow me, watch what I do. And I, we went on holiday together actually. And he said that, you know, you would, you'll probably be captain and you've got to pick things up and you've got to learn how to step back a bit. Um, I'm a lot better than I used to be. I think I'm all right now. You know, Jack believed in me for a start, but I, I've got to tell you a funny story. We went, the end, when he, he was retiring, he was finishing and I get him wind that I'm going to be captain. We go to Germany on an end of season jolly to, I think we'll have in Frankfurt or somewhere. And this is an end of season jolly to end all end of season jollies. And we sort of celebrated every night well into the night. He's made me captain for this next game. So at night time, I've gone to, I thought I've got to get to bed, I've got to go to bed early. And I start mapping out on bits of paper where fielders should stand and so on. The morning after, we turn up and I was like, Captain, here we go, get yourself sorted out. There's only two turned up. <laughs> <laughs> so we got tossed up, well, we'll have a bat. And we, we batted like, in 35 over game, batted like, and kept looking, is there anybody else going? And then Harry Pillion and John Sullivan staggered out of a room. Keith Goodwin, he spent all, it's, it's like an army camp. He spent all day saluting all the soldiers because he used to be in the army and waving aeroplanes off. So I couldn't get him to the ground. And we, we showed up, I think it was me and Edward Slinger, rather me and Edward and me and Bob Bennett, who opened the batting and just had to shore things up. And I've got all these bits of paper in my pocket as to where I could put my fielders. Only got two. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's not quite like that now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you. Um, so it's, that was that was basically after a very successful period. You, you, Lancashire had won mm. um, the Gillette Cup three years on the trot. John Player League twice, um, and. You then became captain mm -hmm. in 73, mm -hmm. following on from Jack, mm -hmm. and were captain relatively young, weren't you? Yeah, what were you, 25, 26? 20, I might have been 26, 27. Um, and we were just on the wane, you know, just on the cusp, right, you know, just on our sell-by date, if you will. And, you know, you're missing Clive. Clive, if West Indies were here, mm -hmm. that's it, gone. And you didn't replace, you, you didn't say, oh, we'll get somebody else in for three or four weeks. Um, and so, you, you know, we lost you, the kingpin player, lost the number one. Um, Farouk, God bless him, what a wonderful character within the team, belligerent batsman, brilliant wicket keeper, just coming to the end. And so we, had a, we did all right and we continued Gillette Cup success, getting to finals. I think you've done great if you get to finals, particularly at that time in the 70s, if you keep getting to finals, you're doing something right. And d during my time, we got to three. You won it again won in one. 75. Won it in 75. Um, in 74, 76, we were just on the wrong end. We played Kent. And I think Alan Knott was man of the match. He got 15. And it was one of them dismal, nasty, horrible days and horrible pitch. And the game didn't happen really. We didn't, and we got beat by North Ants as well. Although North Ants at that time had a really good side, mm. they had a good team. But, but Lancashire, since let's say since '68, had have had 
various uh, 11s, teams, mm. that have been hugely successful in yeah. one day cricket and have only ever won the county championship once. Yeah. Why is that? Why? Is it, is it the glamour of a one day cricket, do you think? Yeah, partly. Um, in, in the early days, over, uh, with uncovered pitches, particularly on this side, and I know you can say, well, Yorkshire were very successful on the east side. We, we, the, the rain comes up here and it drops buckets on Old Trafford. And that definitely hampered us from the players that we had. But I mentioned Cedric Rhodes. And from the club perspective, he would make us fully aware that one day cricket pays the rent. You know, we're filling the ground mm. every time we play a one day game and you're winning. And spectators are clamouring for tickets, sold out every time. So we, we were under no illusions that, that one day cricket was priority at the club. And if you did okay in championship cricket, good. You know, you did all right. Yeah, you're doing all right. We had, you, you, I know we had one year where we were second and pushing and pushing uh, to be champions. And we had a rain curtailed game, final match down at Sussex. And it didn't just happen. And Tony Gregg, I think, were captain at Sussex at the time. And we just didn't push on and finished up fourth. But we had a really good season then. But, but one day cricket was, mm. was the king. On a personal level, your, your cricket playing, it's a long time ago now, but it tends to get pushed back into, into the periphery because you've done so much in the game. Mm. But you had an England uh, career which was perhaps too short, um, just less than 10 games, but you averaged 42 as an opener. Uh, were you frustrated that you didn't play more for England and do better no. as an individual? No, I thought I mean, I'd run my race, my time were up really. I'd only get into that team if Geoffrey Boycott wasn't around. Dennis Amis was a fantastic player. John Edrich had opened and just dropped down. So, you know, these are stellar players. And, and Boyks, uh, for whatever reason, got injured when I got into the team. So I'm in form. They're looking for an opener. I got in, did all right. And, of course, I averaged 42, which helps when you got 214 not out in one knock. <laughs> that that on half help get the average <laughs> up. And so I went to Australia. I'd never really been out of England had a ball, we had a great time, great tour, great opponents, and they beat us 4-1 because they were far better. But I knew at the end of that that, you know, once, and I come back with an injury, with a neck injury, which has reared its head like you wouldn't believe in this last 12 months. And I knew that if I wasn't fit yeah. and I wasn't informed, they were not, they'd look somewhere else, which they mm. did. Did you, did you think to yourself then that the step up to international level was perhaps, unless you were playing at your very, very best, was just a bit beyond you? Yeah, I did. Um, you know, I, when, I, when I played here in England against India and Pakistan, I, I felt, yeah, well at home. Yeah, I'm good enough for this. But when we went to Australia, you come up against Rodney Marsh, who's recently passed away, um, the chapels... Um, Thompson and Lily, Max Nicole. Walker and, and Ashley Mallet, you know, that were tough. Um, and they were better than us, which is how it is. If you, they win 4-1, mm. and we had, good, we had good players, yeah. um, but they were better than us. I'm just, I'm just thinking that, you know, your formative experiences, coming from Accrington, playing for Lancashire, your time under Jack Bond, your time as a leader mm. for, for, for Lancashire, and then... Uh, your time playing as an opening bat for England uh, probably set you in really good stead for what you were going to do in in future. Mm. You went to be an umpire, mm. and then you went to be a coach. Mm. What, did you have a career path planned? Definite. And yeah. you, you really wanted to be... I mean, you were on the verge of becoming an international umpire when you went yeah. back into coaching. Yeah, yeah. Um, in my latter stages, so in my early 30s, early to mid 30s, I finished when I was 36. And I always said, I wish I'd have finished when I was 32. And I'd gone in to see Chris Hassel when I was 32 and said, look, I, I think I'm thinking of calling a date because I want to do this. 
and he said we'd like you to carry on. I carried on to 36, which was a mistake. I could have done two years, could have done to 34. But there were two things, that coming back from England and realising I'm just going to be a county player, I changed my game. I started being a bit of a dasher, where I was careful, building innings, you know, leave the ball. I started going after it, and I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, and the other thing, that in that, when I was 30s, I took all my coaching badges, which, which is the best thing I did. Mm. whilst I was playing. Mm -hmm. I did all this whilst I was playing. And I, you know what I'm like. I'm coming back from these coaching winters, which are tough, down mm. at Lily Shaw. Yeah, yeah. Real tough. And I'm wanting to put all these ideas into play. <laughs> and Bondi and Sav, just shut up. You just get, look, we're the, you just sit. Well, I've got, just sit down. We're not interested. We're not interested. <laughs> but I got all these the badges and I, I've but got you, a, you were always a great thinker about yeah, yeah. the game, a great theorist, it, 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 and you developed oh, into a, a wonderful yeah. innovator, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. Through yeah. your through your time as as Lancashire coach initially. Love that, love that. First up, I came with David Hughes. Yeah. Yosa, Yosa and Alan Ormrod had parted company. I think Alan had gone. Yuzi was here, and the, I came in and looked after the twos, That's and funny. that that was a, a great time. I, I enjoyed that. Then Yosa left. And I was elevated to, to do the job. And so I'd, I was in cahoots with the groundsman, a bloke called Peter Marron. Pete Marron, me and him, and we, we had a dressing room attendant, you know, called Ron Spriggs. Mm -hmm. So I used to get in here. And so I'm, we're in the pavilion, all, all this side. And I wanted an, an office. I wanted to be away, but, you know, if I want to pull a player, I want to come in here, I want to sit down. And Pete Marron made me an office in the defunct urinals. <laughs> and so he boarded these urinals up and, and proper lavish, but, but blocked them all off. And that was my office. It, it was brilliant. At the, right at the back of the pavilion overlooking the police station and the town hall. And so every morning I get in here half past seven and Pete Marin and Ron Spriggs would come up and sit with me with three of us round the table. And it, it always, it, it sort of reminds me of like Bill Shankly and the, the boot room at Liverpool. And Spriggs would make the tea, big, like, big pint pots of tea, put them down. And Spriggs would sit down, he said, have you seen that lad in the twos? He said, he should be in the first team. I don't know how you're not picking him. <laughs> and so Ron Spriggs thought he was picking the team. And, but it, it, it was, uh, you know, the, around the dressing room, I, I think I ate them hard, the players at that time because I had all these slogans around the dressing room, all, you know, commitment, character, charisma, all over there. And they're coming in and what that's, that's what we are. That's what we are. I had a sign also, this is Old Trafford. You were, all, you were ahead of your time in that though, really, I think, in terms of coaching. I don't think, I think you innovated that sort of approach. You, you, I remember you playing music to the players as yeah, well. Yeah, to, little to bit. stir them up or calm them down, whichever. Yeah, yeah. stir them up. Uh, but when you say you play music, there were little clips, like a minute and a half, nothing more than that. And then I got them all to choose their own clip and play that. And it, So I wanted them to go out, I wanted to run down the steps at Old Trafford and flipping charge onto the field and let everybody know, particularly the oppo, that we're here for business. That's what we do. And the one thing I said to, to the lads, I didn't say a lot, didn't say a lot. I said, we might not be the best batters. We might not be the best ballers, but we will be the best fielders. We work like stink on fielding and fitness so that we'd, we'd just swarming all over them in the field. And that, you know, I always, particularly one day cricket, we, you know, I had lads like Gary Yates, Peter Martin, young Glenn Chappell, Ian Austin. My lad Graham, Neil Fairbrother, the Crawley, Atherton, Gallion, name them all. Fantastic team, that. Brilliant team. I said, in one day game, you switched on. I said, there'll be one moment that we have to win. It's that moment of magic that when somebody picks the ball up and runs him out. And I'll never forget playing Yorkshire on a big game. Darren Lehman. He's probably the best overseas player they've had. Mm. 
And I, I said, we run him out. He's got a bit of weight, look at him, tubby. He's a bit tubby. I said, we run him out. I said, he'll want to get to the other end. We run him out. I said, if he's on strike, ball five, six, tighten up, infield, tighten it up. We're running him out. Forget the other geezer, run him out. And it were our Graham. It was rapid. Graham was ready. You wouldn't think low so. Low to the that. ground as yeah, well. He was low to the ground yeah. and he picked, and, and I'm on that balcony there, across the other side. And as soon as he, he's pushed, you know, he, he's, he's sort of back foot, which he's, he's got another yard to make up, because yeah. he's on the back. He's pushed it and Graham's move round at cover like slow motion. And I've got hold of the edge of the, and run him out. And he hit the stumps <laughs> full on. And he would get no DR and none of that business. And they will go to the umpire upstairs and the old square leg umpire give him out. And I'm jumping about on the balcony. <laughs> you had a very talented team. I don't mm. think there's ever been a good coach of a bad side, has there? No. But no. that, let's forget that. Yeah. You were a good yeah. coach of a good team. And we forgot a bloke called Akram. Oh, yeah, he was quite <laughs> good. Yeah, well, there you go. If you have him, you've got two players in one and one of the best ever, haven't you? Well, if ever, I get asked every time, I get asked, what's your best world 11 that you've seen? So I start at number eight, I've just put Akram, and at number nine, I put Warren, and then build the rest of it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's just break off. Shane Warren recently um, died in tragic circumstances. Uh, for me, he was the best spin bowler I've ever seen, uh, and one of the top three cricketers I've ever seen. And a great bloke. Top bloke. Fantastic bloke. Kind. Yeah, very, very generous. Yeah. Great mate. One of the, I'll tell you how good a mate he is from the other end of the world. If you're in adversity, he'll ring you. Mm. He'll just give you a call. And so that was a tragedy, but he lived life to the full. Sleeping was a damn nuisance. And so the whole cricket world will miss him. And there've been some great players. There's been some of the greatest players. Haven't been the nicest people. Mm -hmm. This bloke with top drawer. And you, you were always a great admirer of spin bowling as well, and spin mm -hmm. bowlers. Would he be the best you've seen? Yeah, yeah, he is murally. Yeah, well, he's he... right up there. Yeah. Um, and when you talk about spin ball, he's always spin, rip it. Make it go both ways, which both of them lads could do. And so he championed the game, uh, did Shane Warren. Not just resting back and, you know, I'm a great bowler, look at me, I'm brilliant. He championed the game of cricket, he cared. He'd control the game as well, wouldn't he? Oh, I. It, it, it would come under his spell, whether, it, you, were, he, whether you were on his side or, 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 more importantly, if you were against him. He'd make damn sure that him at the other end is playing me, not the ball. I used to, I mean, when I was in England, when we play against him, I'd say, don't play him, play the ball. He'll be right into you, which he was. He loved that aspect of it. Mm. Just a stare and a chip and a bit of something. And a hugely perceptive commentator in... in brilliant. In late, late yeah, late absolutely late brilliant. Well. A big regret that he didn't become Australia captain. He, yeah. he couldn't become Australia captain, but he, you know, he had a very colourful life yeah. um, and he'll be, be, he will be sorely missed. OK, back to you, back to um, your coaching, which you did with considerable success for Lancashire. It wasn't long before you were recognised by the England hierarchy and appointed England coach. Mm. That must have been a fantastic uh, time of your life. It, it was, with Atherton as captain. You know, that was a, a good combo. Um, and Raymond Illingworth was doing the whole job, if you remember, he was supremo. Mm. But Illy was great. You know, when I came well, in and, and, and took over that side of things, it, of sort of preparing the team. So let's look at, at that time in the late 90s, the coach, you know, I would expect him to... Uh, sorry to interrupt, but it's not a bad blueprint for where we are now with English cricket the way it was then. Mm. Because yeah. we, we're basically rudderless at the moment, I yeah. think. Yeah. But anyway, go back to you. Back to you. Yeah, so, so Illy was doing everything. I came in to prepare the team. That's, that's how it was. It, I, I always looked at... It, 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 if, I, if I have to tell this bloke who's opening the batting for England how to hold the bat, there's something wrong. Yeah. But you prepare them mm. to play and you're giving them knowledge, strengths and weaknesses of the opposition, 
we had monitors and, and VHS videos, all that sort of thing of, of this is how he plays, these are his vulnerable points, this is you doing brilliantly, by the way, put little clips on, and, and that, that worked, and that was different, nobody else was doing it, nobody uh, was doing that sort of thing. Um, but the main thing for me would be to prepare the team and then hand it over to Mike Latherton or Alex Stewart. The captain. Because it, it, he's running the show then, yeah. right? there's nothing you can do over five days. Were you not helped tremendously by the fact there was an influential, stable uh, individual who was in charge of the ECB at the time, and that was Ian McLaurin? Yeah, he, McLaurin was good, and he, he came in, and you could tell from his big business and, and Tesco's and chairman that he was a bit taken aback, and he had to... He, he, what, by the... Yeah. Was there an... Amateurish nature. Yeah, did you yeah, think? yeah. That, that's exactly without being it. unkind. Yeah, it, it, it needed to. But you tried to bring it into the professional yeah. area. You, you've already said we did video analysis. Yeah, um, yeah. We prepared the play. We didn't coach yeah. them. We didn't, weren't yeah. technical with them. No, but but we, we had technical people like as they do now. We had a yeah. bowling coach, batting coach, wicket keeping coach who would work with the players. So if I'm head coach, I'm sort of preparing everything and organising everything. And then it's over to the captain, who's, who's not had to do anything with that. That's your job now, the team. You work the team tactically. I can't, you cannot start, as I did with Winker, start shouting, move him round there. Atherton, Stewart, or whoever, captain's the side. You know, if you don't like the captain, change him. Um, but that's the way that it was. But weren't you, in conjunction with Ian McLaurin, instrumental in bringing in... Central contracts. No, I wanted. We, you, well, the, you wanted behind them. the scenes, it were always central contracts, but there was no money. Mm. They didn't have the money, and then there became a, a big sea change in the year two thousand when broadcast deals started up, up, yeah. up, um, and that's when England got on a level footing with the rest of the world with central contracts, whereas players were. It's not just to play for England is an icing on the cake. Playing for England is your job. Mm. That's what you do for a living. And that's where you get your money. Mm. And now, fabulously, they're well paid. Cricketers are pretty well paid. Who do you have, Anderson or Statham? Poor, jeez. Well, number one, I'd, be, I'd say I want both of them for a kickoff. <laughs> um, Anderson or Statham? Uncovered pitches. Anderson or Statham? You can't pick, can you? You can't. Really you can't. I mean, Do you know, I, I think know Jimmy's, pick... Jimmy's career in numbers is yeah. far superior to Brian. Yeah. But... He, he, in in, in um, test match numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not in career numbers. Brian's no. got two and a half thousand wickets. Yeah. yeah. But about the same pace, mm. about 85, lively enough, deadly accurate. Statham, you, you, in uncovered pitches, used to knock a little channel out. We're Nothing not talking left. about pitches with loam and clay, just the, the soil of the area. He'd knock a, a, a little strip out um, we, we, because of the accuracy. It'd be the size of a dinner mat, wouldn't it? Yeah, basically. Yeah, and Jim's the same. He had just, it, it's, it's that God given talent that they bowl that length that is so awkward for any batter. There's a magic length, it's, and it, it's a span of about that. It's the, the length that you, says to the batsman, do you play forward or do, do you I play back? back? And, and by the time you've made your mind up, it's, you've nicked it. That's it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it, it's simple, but so mm. hard to do. Yeah. Um, don't mind you not being definitive on that, that's fine. You, you've been in the game, as I said earlier, and we'll come to the end of this shortly, in the best part of 60 years, in all your guises. And your broadcasting and your speaking has mm. sort of sat in the background mm. for a lot of it, and obviously not in the last 20 years, but you'll have seen an inordinate number of cricketers. Mm -hmm. And I'll put you on the spot now. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell me mm -hmm. who you think is the best player you've seen who played for England for a start. Kevin Peterson. Yeah, really. Yeah, number one, Kevin Peterson. Because he, he, could, he could just 
bend everybody to his will and was... do extraordinary things mm. and from from the job that we did he got you on the edge of your seat mm. um, you know powerful big tall commanding reminding me a lot of Ted Dexter um, same sort of build and had a presence and Peter I don't know Peterson I don't know Kevin Peterson at all really to say hello to him but um, as an England player he, he was my number one Graham Gooch Brave, thorough, mm. dedicated. Um, Jeffrey, Jeffrey boycott. It, get past that. Mm. <laughs> get past that flipping lot. And, and I, I've had that many up and downers with him. Ooh. Oh, it's Lancashire Yorkshire like that. Yeah. But I still class him as one of my best mates. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're talking yeah, nonsense. I don't talk as much nonsense as you. <laughs> he's in awkward zone. So, oh but, dear me. But fanatical about the game, and does he ever talk sense about it? Yeah. I, yeah. Well, he doesn't now because he's gone. Yeah. Must well, be crackers. Anyway. Um, okay. Peterson, the best played for England, general in general, any country. Mm -hmm. Give me, a, give me a player. Batter? Yeah, whatever. Batter me, me three, I could qualify this and say the three, three the favourite players yeah. are all West Indians. Mm, good. Gary Sobers, Viv Richards, Brian Lara. Them three. All left-handed batters as well. Great, yeah. Great players. Ricky Ponting. And there's a, the big debate that you, you, we can do it here in Lancashire's dressing room. You, you try and have this debate in in Mumbai. Who's the best player, Sachin Tendulkar or Virat Kohli? Now, I've seen them both, I've worked on them both. Both unbelievably talented. And I've only got one place in my team. I've got one place at number four, number five, wherever. Who am I going to pick? Virat Kohli. Now, I've just alienated a country. <laughs> <laughs> They've got... <laughs> But yeah. I'd have Virat Kohli, a real battler. I like that type of player. But another of my favourite players, Javi me and Dad. Oh, Just yeah. a real battler. I get stuck in. Another of my favourite player. Now I haven't got. I wanted to tell you. No. I wanted to tell you. Tell me. So we, uh, my favourite and all time. We've all talked batters there. Yes. Was he Akram? I was going to say. Yeah. Akram. You've left Akram out. Well, Akram. And every managed... time. Yeah, and he his was, mate, Wakar, he was great phenomenal, man. Akram. W Wakar, brilliant man. The yeah. pair of them together. Yeah. Was he even Wakar? Yeah. Um, okay, just before we, we say Tara, um, you've done everything in the game. I don't think there's anything you haven't done. Probably professionally scored the game, but that's by Notching. the by. Notching. Notching. Notching, yeah. So playing, captaining, coaching, umpiring, broadcasting. Which element of your varied career have you enjoyed the most? Well, at 75 years of age, broadcasting. Although at the minute I'm out of work worldwide. Won't um, be for long. But, um, well, there's no better than playing, is there? Yeah. I loved umpiring. That, that was, I just, my lad umpires, my eldest lad. And I just said to him, don't take it too seriously. <laughs> don't take it. I said, because we've all been players and we're never out. Mm. Batters are never out, never. I got, in, in, this, in this changing room, Livy, Livy comes up to me. Well, he's never out, Livy. Li, well, he comes up to me. And he, he's a flipping handy lad. Yeah. He, he can look after himself, Livingston. Yeah. He said, can you tell that lad of yours that you can't be out LBW if you hit on the pad at playing a shot and you're outside the line of the stumps? And how quick as I didn't miss a beat, I was straight back at him. I said, you mean to tell me you've been hit on the leg? Out there, it's the <laughs> flattest thing I've ever. How you've been hit on the leg? I said you should be able to bat out there without pads. I said no excuse for getting. I'd have give you out just for getting hit on the leg and walked off. And he looked at me. <laughs> David, thank you very much indeed. Um, Seventy-five now and still going strong. Keep going forever.